Um, and it's Dr. Plemons here with day one of microeconomics. Uh, micro is actually my favorite part of econ, so I'm really excited to teach this class and it's gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna have a really awesome semester. Just a quick reminder, this is starting with chapter one material. If you haven't seen the overview videos, please go to the part one section of the course or the syllabus section of the course. I have some videos there that'll show you a little bit more about how we're gonna format our days and how we're kind of gonna go through this journey together. But with that, let's go ahead and jump right into chapter one. This is going to be in two parts of a video. So the first one's going to be going over kind of what is micro? How is this different from macro? And then the second video from chapter one is going to be reviewing the economic way of thinking. So how are we going to approach questions? Because the way that we start to question things in this class is actually really unique and fascinating. So with that, let's go ahead and jump right on into it. So I'll go ahead and screen share over here put my little camera at the bottom all right chapter one now um pro tip a lot of people are probably frantically getting the textbooks right now and things like that i will cover all the material that you're going to need in this course in between the slides my lecture notes and everything else so the the textbook is a great help it's a great assistance but if you don't have it don't panic all right okay so chapter one what is economics it's kind of the fun part, it's the, it's the beginning. Now I start out every chapter with our chapter goals. What I really hope that you will be able to do by the end of this chapter. These are really important to think about when you start thinking about my midterms or my test because I want to refer back to these chapter goals. Because at the end of this, these are the things that I think will most help you in your real lives, right? Because you're in here for more than just a micro class. You're in here to learn information to help you with, with your future jobs, your future careers. So I built the chapter goals based around what is going to be the long-term most impactful pieces for you. All right, so the chapter goals in this one. One, be able to define what economics is and distinguish between micro and macroeconomics. They are very different. And believe me, microeconomists and macroeconomists, they'll fight each other sometimes. We wanna know what the difference is. So we're gonna go over that. Question two, our, our guess chapter goal two, <laughs> I'm awkward. Um, explain the two big questions of economics. So these are gonna start to motivate how we're going to approach questions. The third one is to describe the key ideas that define the economic way of thinking because it's a different way of approaching problems. So let's go into it. Um, let's say that you're recently in Edwardsville. You may be here in person, you may not be in here in person right now, but Edwardsville is a gorgeous and wonderful town. I love living here. Um, these are some older pictures actually. This is back when Source Juicery was on this side of Artisan instead of the other side. And I think this is a, this is the music place. This is a running store now. Bigelow's is about to become a bar. So there's all this like interesting and fantastic places here, but we need to know how do they make decisions? How do each of these businesses know where to locate? How did Source Juicery know to move from one side of Artisan to the other? Why was that going to be better for their foot traffic? How was that going to be better for the amount of money that they could bring in or what they could produce? How do they make their decisions? And that's kind of the foundational part of economics, right? Because why does economics even exist? Well, all economic questions arise because we want more than we can get, right? Ideally, in a beautiful world, um, I would have all the money that I possibly want, and I could work only the days I felt like working, and I could eat all the pizza that I ever want in the world. I'm going to be talking about pizza a lot in this class, by the way. <laughs> but we always want more than we want. But we can't always have it, right? I would like to have all the money in the world. I would like to eat all the pizza out there. I would like to rescue all the adorable kitties there are. Um, but we can't satisfy our wants because there exists this idea of scarcity. There's only so many hours in the day. You only have so much money for your goods and services, right? And because we have this scarcity, because we have to make choices, like if I got a hundred bucks in my pocket, I got to figure out if I'm filling up my gas tank or if I'm going to go buy some new books or if I'm going to go pay my electricity bill, right? Because I have the scarcity of only $100 and multiple things I could do with it. Well, because we face this scarcity, we have to make choices. I have to choose if I'm going to go buy books. I have to choose if I'm going to go pay the power bill. And these choices that we make depend on the incentives we face. If I pay the power bill, the lights stay on in my house and my family's very happy, right? Because I have a cat who has an automatic food feeder that requires electricity. And if that doesn't go off, she will scream bloody murder. You'll know because you'll hear her at the door a few times. Or she'll jump in front of the camera. That also happens too. 
Um, anyways, so that's one type of incentive, like satisfy things, make them happy. Another incentive could be, all right, I could spend this $100 on books. And if I spend that money on books, then I have all that new information and I have all that new stuff and knowledge and cool stories, right? That, that I'll get enjoyment from. So there's incentives for each choice. And we're going to make our choices based upon what those incentives look like right? Incentives are just rewards that encourage actions or penalties that discourage actions. Why do you not speed down the road not wearing a seatbelt? Um, a lot of it's because, you know, that's dangerous, right? But part of it's because you don't want a ticket because tickets aren't fun and you don't want a very lengthy and big ticket that you have to deal with and go to court and things like that because there's penalties that will discourage you from this action. So there's both good incentives and bad incentives. That's something important to think about because I always have questions that relate to that. So actually, let's go ahead and give one of these questions. Um, which of the following situations illustrates what an incentive is? Is it A, Dave warns his students that they will fail his class if they don't do the work? Is it B, Dirk's children misbehave during dinner? Is it C, Lee gives his children candy if they behave during the movie? Or is it A and C? Well, let's go through each of these. A, Dave warns his students that they will fail if they don't work harder. Okay, um, probably not the nicest way to talk to your students, but so this is some sort of penalty that he's saying, right? He's saying, oh, if you don't do good, you're not gonna do well in this class. That, that's creating a sort of incentive that, that there's some penalty if this behavior is not done. Uh, so yeah, sure, that check mark, incentive. Um, B, Dirk's children misbehave during dinner. Well, there's nothing that's really causing that, right? We're not really seeing what might be incentivizing it from a penalty or from a benefit. So maybe not B, but let's look at C. Lee gives his children candy if they behave during the movie. Now, this would be sort of a positive incentive. We just saw an A, an example of a negative incentive, but we have positive incentives too of, hey, if you do this, you get candy. Or, hey, if you do this, you get money. Uh, people love those things. Those are nice, happy, positive incentives. So that counts in our incentive category. We'd go ahead and check mark that off. So in this, we see that both A and C would be incentives. I, I would kind of think through different examples like that, you know, pro tip. Uh, so what is economics at the end of the day? Economics is a social science. So we're not a hard science. We're not, we're not using a bunch of beakers and trying to figure out atoms, but we are a science because we're trying to figure out how people think. We try to figure out the behavior of firms. We try to figure out the behavior of why people do what they do. Why do board games look the way that they do? Why, why do they incentivize? Why does this marketing campaign, why is it all blue and why do they have this coupon? There's so many different things and we need to figure out kind of the science behind why they matter and how they work, right? So economics is a social science that studies the choices that individuals, businesses, governments, entire societies make as they cope with scarcity and the incentives that influence those choices. So every single thing that we're going to be talking about comes back to one base definition. We have options, right? You can do one thing or you can do another thing and there's going to be incentives for doing those things. And we, as, as our social scientists selves, are going to go in and we're going to study these choices that people make when they're faced with scarcity and figure out why. And that is just so freaking cool, right? It's so neat. All right, but economics is kind of divided into two main parts. So you'll hear about this a lot, especially if you're also going to be taking the macroeconomics course sequence. So we have macro, which is kind of the big picture analysis. This is looking at how governments trade in between each other. This is how um, giant industries interact with each other. This is how we figure out, um, if, for example, TikTok, you know, if, if TikTok's still a thing by the time this video comes out, um, TikTok, okay, if they're based in China or the United States, or if there's a developer fund, how do these different pieces work together, right? It's looking at these big picture ideas. Now, microeconomics, on the other hand, this is looking at kind of the individual level decisions. I want to know, why did that household buy a new lawnmower? Why did that business decide to move to North Carolina instead of North Dakota, right? It's looking at kind of the more individual level decisions. So macro is kind of big picture country levels and micro is that individual household or individual business or individual um, person, 
I guess, the decisions that they make. So let's give them more formal definitions, right? For microeconomics, it's the study of choice that individuals and businesses make. Why does a person do this? Why does a business do this? And how do they interact in markets? How are they influenced by government? Macro, on the other hand, is the study and the performance of national and global economies and how they all work together. I am not a macroeconomist. I do not want to be a macroeconomist. I'm more of that micro level decision. I want to figure out exactly why someone moves somewhere and how they do these different things. Not to say there's anything wrong with macro. If you're interested in macro, we have some fantastic macro economists in the department that would be happy to work with you and help lead you through your journey. But if you're interested in micro, I got you. All right, so we have two big questions in economics. There's two things that we really want to answer at the end of the day, and these are kind of our starting point questions. These are where we're going to start formulating our ideas and opinions, right? Okay, so first question. How do choices determine what, how, and for whom? goods and services are produced. Let's think about it. Okay. All right. Um, what do I got here? Got my cool little tomato timer. I actually use this to force myself to write. I'll put like 25 minutes on it and I have to not be distracted for that 25 minutes. It's a great study tool if you ever feel like doing it, you know, in, in the course of your career. Anyways, tomato timer. Okay, cool. Made of plastic. Has a ringing bell thing. What is this? Well, we've determined it's a timer. They've figured out what color it's going to be. It's going to be a red timer. Um, how are they going to make it? Well, I don't really know that. These are choices that the company has to make. They have to figure out, are they going to build the pieces themselves? Are they going to form the plastic themselves? Or are they going to buy pieces and assemble it? These are kind of the how parts of the question. And then there's the for whom. Who does the company produce this for? Is it stressed out academics that have writing deadlines that need to figure out how to write? Yeah, probably. I mean, we see that. Is this necessarily for maybe you know, a toddler who doesn't really care about time or things like that? No, not, not, not necessarily. So you have to figure out what's being produced, how it's being produced, and for whom it's being produced. So who's our audience? Who's going to be the person that might potentially purchase this good or service? So that's, that's big question number one. Okay, big question number two. When do choices made in the pursuit of self-interest also promote the social interest? This one's, this one's fascinating, right? Um, I, I like to think I help the environment. I have a garden, I make my own compost, I am a vegetarian, I do all these different things, I, I try to help the world, I try to volunteer on the weekends, but I drive an SUV. Um, not good for the environment, right? But I love my SUV. So that choice to drive an SUV, well, that's on me. That's a choice that I'm making in the pursuit of my self-interest. What would make me the happiest? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it also promotes the social interest. Maybe it's not best for society if I drive a gas guzzling SUV. Maybe. It could also be the point that maybe a lot of people really like SUVs, but they also want to help the environment. So maybe society as a whole and the firms that are operating within society might decide, ah, oh, Okay, maybe we'll start making these, you know, hybrid cars, or maybe we'll start making them more fuel efficient, or maybe we'll make it so the exhaust problem isn't as bad from them. Maybe we'll make them a little bit better for society so that people could still have their self-interest, but their self-interest is both SUVs and helping the environment. So maybe they might tweak it just a little. There's choices that we're going to make. Every choice you make is for you. Taking this class, that's, that's a choice for your self-interest because you think in the long run it's best for you. What book you read, if you decide to go out to dinner or to the movies or if you decide to study that night. Everything that you do is a choice that's made in the pursuit of your self-interest. Now, how do we combine that with the social interest and how do we think about these interconnected pieces? That's a big question and that's one that we will be studying for the, for the course of this semester and if you're interested in it more afterwards we have more econ courses um, for example i teach the public courses that means that i kind of figure out why do local state and national governments make the decisions they do why do they do that how do they do that like what do taxes look like what do expenditures look like 
So I'm a public person. Um, in our department, we also have health people. You want to know why a saline bag costs $750 at some hospitals and $13 at others? We have a health economist to help you with that problem. We have labor econ, international, social econ. That's a lot of fun. Sports economics. You want to know, like, you know, how to structure games and how to sell concessions and where to put a stadium. We can all answer questions like that because everything at the end of the day comes back. All these big pieces of economics where we have all these different types of problems, it all comes back to the big questions that we need to answer. What, how, and for whom? And what happens with self-interest and social interest? When do they align? When do they don't? All right, so let's go a little bit deeper into the first question. I know I kind of did a, a rough overview, but how do choices determine what, how, and for whom goods and services are produced? Well, I keep saying this term, goods and services, but what does goods and services actually mean? Well, these are the objects that people value. These are the things that we produce to satisfy human wants. No one would make tomato timers if there wasn't a stressed professor who wants to buy tomato timers, right? Um, that gives it inherent value. So when I'm talking about goods and services, it's everything. It's the coffee mugs, it's your trip to McDonald's, it's um, your knitting supplies, it's your radios, but it's also the services. It's your accountant, it's your financial planner. I'm pretty sure that a lot of people taking this class will either be accountants or financial planners or a variety of other things where you might have a financial planner or accountant one day. Um, it could be the person who comes and mows the SIUE lawn. It could be the person who, so it could be services that are rendered or goods that are produced. So that's kind of a giant encompassing piece of the things that we're producing because people want them. All right, so when we have these goods and services, these things that we value that we're kind of producing to satisfy human wants, we need to think about what that really means. It's very different for each person right? I might value um, having a cute manicure. I did this myself. I'm kind of happy. It's like the first time I haven't painted my whole hand. It's so nice. Um, I might value that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that someone else values that. Someone else might value, I don't know, um, baseball. I'm, I'm a football person myself. Someone else might value baseball more than I do. So these are different goods and services we need to figure out kind of what people's interests are, how they're really produced. Let's, let's think big, let's think big first. Let's look at the country level. So what does the US produce? Um, in the United States, agriculture is less than 1% of total production. All the goods and services that are produced in the United States, agriculture is actually like less than 1% of that. It's a very small amount, right? Manufactured goods on the other hand, so like making cars in Detroit or making other things like that, that's about 19% of things. The other 80% are services. The United States economy is actually really based in a service-based economy. It's producing new uh, software, it's producing new websites, it's producing um, someone who can give you financial advice, it's producing someone who can help you with marketing and branding, or, or someone who, there's all these big thoughts, right? Um, so the United States, we're really a service-based economy, and we have a little bit of goods, manufactured goods, and we have like a little bit of agriculture. Now that's not the same in every country. Um, let's let's take Ethiopia for comparison. Oh man, Ethiopian food's so good. I'm kind of in the mood for that. But in Ethiopia, um, about 36% of their production is agricultural based, right? So that's slightly over a third of all the things that that country produces is agricultural. That's way different from the 1% that, that the US is. About 17% are manufactured goods. So that, that's pretty similar. And about 47% are different types of services. So these are all a little different. Um, if, if we break it down and we look at the range of goods and services that are produced in each country, when we try to compare the United States to China to Ethiopia, the mixture of agriculture or industry or services is going to be very different depending on where you are. And a lot of that's because what natural resources are there? What sort of skills and labor are there? What sort of education system is, is there? Um, do people leave that country? Do they come to that country? What's trade like? There's so many different questions we're gonna ask in economics to try to figure out why are some places different? Different's not bad. 
difference pretty good. But why and how and for what purpose? That goes all the way back to, you know, the how, the what, and, and the for whom of, of this course and this question, right? So what determines these patterns of production? Why is it that the United States is very service-based? Why is it that Ethiopia is more agricultural-based? How do choices end up determining the quantity of each item produced in a country? We're going to figure that out because there's incentives in these countries, right? There's an incentive to have a new service sector. There's an incentive to produce more different types of foods when you have a very good climate for that particular type of food. And because these incentives exist, people are making choices between those incentives. When they're making those choices, we're studying that. And that is economics. <laughs> I love econ so much. So what's the how, right? We kind of have the what. Okay, so people are producing agriculture services and, and goods. <laughs> I don't know why I blinked. How are they producing those though? Well, and this one's really important. If there's something that you're going to listen to in this lecture, listen to the next two minutes of information that I'm going to give you because I ask about these particular factors of production on every midterm you will have, right? Okay, so goods and services are produced using productive resources. Um, this tomato timer did not exist out of nowhere, right? Uh, it had to be created. What went into this? Well, there's different factors of production for producing some sort of good and service. We're going to break it into four categories, right? We have our land. Land is the place that we grow stuff on. Land is all the natural resources that are there. Land is lots of other things, right? We're going to kind of go deeper into that. Then we have labor. We need workers to build stuff. If I throw a bunch of plastic into a pile, it will not build itself unless there's a really cool machine, but someone has to build the machine, right? So there's some sort of labor input. Then there's a capital input. Capital input doesn't just mean money. People always get a little confused about that because they kind of hear it in the news, ah, oh, capital. And then they're like, oh, money. No, capital is the non-human resources. It's the machines, it's the production line. And then, okay, so we have our land, we have our labor, we have our capital, but we need someone to put it all together. Because just having a pile of plastic and a person standing there and a machine does not necessarily make those things work together. The things that organize these factors of production, we call that entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is a fascinating creature. So let's break it up. I like kind of doing it in this grid. If I were you, I would write down this grid. I would definitely learn this grid because it's something that I'm going to refer back to a lot. And thank you for also watching the lecture videos because I do give a lot of test hints in the lecture videos. So let's break this up. First, land. So we got our land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Land is kind of the gifts of nature. They're the things that would be there if humans weren't, right? It's, it's the hills, it's the grass, it's the natural resources, it's the tanzanite mines, it's the alexandrite mines, it's the watershed. Um, it's the things that would be there regardless. And we use kind of these gifts of nature to produce goods and services. We need the petroleum that's going to go in to be refined, to eventually be plastic, and we're going to need the metal to make the little bell thing, right? Those, those are gifts of nature. So that's land. Okay, then we have the labor input. Labor is the work time and work effort that people put into producing a good and service. All right, um, I sit here and I'm recording a video for this class. This is part of the labor that I'm putting in. It's my work time, it's my work effort. Someone has to build this timer. They're going to have work time and work effort into producing a good and service, whether it's a physical good, like a timer, or kind of a service, like me teaching you. This isn't a service that I provide for money. Um, because that, that's also a thing that we're going to talk a lot about in economics is everything's incentivized by money. The quality of labor depends on the human capital that's in it, right? Um, it's really simple. Okay, I, I say it's simple. It's simple to drive in a nail of a hammer, though I have definitely messed up my fingers a good number of times doing that, so maybe it's not as simple as I think. But then let's say that maybe you wanted to be an accountant. Well, there's, there's knowledge and skills that you need from education to do that. Maybe you want to be a dentist. 
Well, then there's training you need. There's experience you need. All the training and experience and knowledge and skills that you obtain by working your butt off, that's called human capital. Sitting in this class, watching this lecture, you're developing your human capital. And the more human capital you have, the higher the quality of labor. Now that's pretty interesting because we also see that this higher quality of labor tends to be correlated with higher wages for that labor because it means that you had to put a lot into it, a lot of work and effort into it, which means that there's less people you're competing with the higher and higher you go. So that's kind of neat. So we have labor and labor is a function of human capital. Okay, not to be confused with capital, our third category. So human capital, this is the knowledge and skills that you have. What capital is, so minus the little human part, is the non-human elements, right? These are the tools, these are the instruments, these are the machines, this is the building. Uh, the, so let's go down to SIUE, I work in Alumni Hall, I generally teach in Alumni Hall. Um, so we have the building. I have my office. My office has a computer in it. It also has a lot of accessibility programs and things like that so that I'm able to make my stuff accessible for all different types of students okay so we have some some machines um, then we also have tools I have a bunch of stuff in there because generally if this is an in-person class we play a lot of in-person games so I have those tools and pieces of equipment don't worry we'll still have online games but I can't give you in-person games so we have these tools and these instruments all these things together these non-human elements that is capital all right so we got our land our labor and capital but just because I, I throw a human into a classroom filled with uh, different um, projectors and things uh, on pieces of land, that is, that's not going to make it all work together, right? That's not going to be a class. The thing that's going to bring, you know, those, those projected monitors and the person and the equipment and the land together and organize that, that's entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship just is kind of a human resource. It's a person that comes in and organizes these things together to create a good or service. It gives us our end product. It's so neat. All right. I'm sorry. I'm so excited. Uh, I love this course. I promise it's actually very endearing in person. I have no idea how it's going to crawl across online. We'll find out. So let me talk a little bit more about that human capital aspect. It's a really important concept that you get through this course. What does that look like over time? Okay, back in the 1900s, a good bit of time ago, like 120 years and some change ago, about 24% of people had less than five years of elementary school. It wasn't really required. Back in 1900s, we didn't have the same labor laws for children. So a lot of the time, once you were functionally useful to operate a machine, you would just go to work, right? Um, about another... 60% of people had some amount of high school. They'd maybe complete a year or two enough to be able to, to read and, and function. And back then it was also a much more religious based economy, right? Where a lot of the exchanges of goods and services happened in a religious format. So you needed enough to be able to like read text. So we had some people who had less than five years of elementary school, some high school and very few people completed high school or college in those times. So right here, you know, this, this little bit, because that's kind of what the economy required in the 1900s. In the 1900s, we were a very agricultural based economy, which means we needed a lot of manpower in fields, right? Um, also back then we produced goods and services. We, we kind of were more likely to produce things. Uh, we didn't have a financial planner and a, what are they called? Like Instagram influencer. These jobs didn't exist back then. Um, these, these service sectors were much less prevalent. Uh, so our, our human capital was very driven by the fact that we were an agricultural and manufacturing economy. Now, over time, child labor laws came in. We had a couple of different wars. There ended up being some more competition for different goods and services. Computers happened. Um, then we ended up having different sort of processing. We had the ability to have more information. Then the internet became released for everyone. And then now uh, you could just order a pizza or do all these other things or be able to communicate with people instantaneously across the world, right? And as times have changed, the scope of jobs have changed. The human capital that was required 
changed. Now, there's very few people ha who have less than five years of elementary school. That's also because we also have laws where you can't drop out uh, before a certain age. Then there's a very small number of people who have some high school education. Completing high school is much more prevalent in today's age. Um, having some sort of college experience, even if it's a partial college experience or a full four year bachelor degree or more is much more prevalent because we've moved from this agricultural based economy to a service based economy. Now we have the cool marketing managing Instagram uh, people. We have different sort of services like Netflix, which provides entertainment to people. We have these new sorts of service based economies, which do require a higher level of competency in certain subjects. So a bachelor's degree is becoming much more necessary to become competitive in this world. Now, we call this all human capital. Because remember, human capital is the knowledge you have, it's the skills you have, it's kind of all the things that you've gotten from training and experience. Well, school is a training and experience and see how human capital has grown over time. I just think that's so neat. Um, so what we see is that the population today is completely different from what the population back in 1900 was. Economics tries to explain this. So we look at a graph like this, a lot of the time economists do, not necessarily me because I'm not an education economist, I'm more of like a public economist, but education economists would look at this and they're like, oh wow, look at how education's changed over these years, why? How much of this is due to us becoming a service-based economy? How much of this is due towards competition? How much of this is due because of the baby boomer generation? And they're gonna go through and they're going to try to explain why these trends exist. And that's kind of some of the fun stuff that economists does. So we kind of have the how and we have the what. Now we need the for whom part of the equation, right? So why, why do we have land? Why do we bother to work a job? Why, why the labor issue? Why do we use certain machines and capital? Well, that comes down to the basic for who part of the equation. People produce these tomato timers because there are people who will buy these tomato timers, right? Pintel, I think this is Pintel, right? No, this is Pilot. The Pilot G2 gel pens are so nice. I wrote the company and they like sent me back some free pens because I just wrote a really nice letter. Anyways, um, these are created. Why are these created? For whom are these created? Well, who gets the goods and services kind of depends on the incomes that people earn, right? A $45,000, can you get a Mercedes Benz for $45,000? I have no idea. Let's assume Mercedes Benz are $45,000. And if I'm wrong, feel free to email me with links being like, you're wrong, and I will change my lectures later. But let's say that we have that sort of situation. Okay, well, if a Mercedes Benz costs $45,000, there's not a lot of people who can afford them, right? Uh, your average cashier, I've been a cashier for a lot of years in my life before, um, could not afford a Mercedes Benz. Teachers, not always paid the best. They may not be able to afford it, but CEOs, certainly, they might actually have more right, or higher end cars. So the people who get goods and services kind of depend on the incomes that people earn. Now, how do we earn income? It's not just working for a living, right? There's lots of different sources. Let's say that you own a bunch of land. Let's say I own a couple acres and someone wants to stay on that, those, those acres or maybe they want to farm out there or maybe they want to do something else. Uh, well, that land, that physical land earns rent. Someone has to pay me rent to use it if it belongs to me, right? Labor and that, and that rent, that's one form of income. Okay, then we have wages, right? So working for a living, I teach, I research. It's super fun, I like it. I work for a living though for wages. Many of you probably also have jobs or you're trying to get jobs or you're, or you're trying to you know, better your economic standing in life by being in class so you can get better jobs, right? This labor input, the work that you do, the physical work time and the work effort, that earns wages. So we have two types of income, rent, wages, then there's interest. Let's say that maybe I owned a bunch of pizza ovens. Well, I'm sitting here teaching class. I can't use pizza ovens at the same time, right? So maybe I instead lend them to people. Okay, well, I'm gonna get interest on that investment. 
maybe I help buy computers for a finance company. Well, they're, they're going to have to give me like some interest on that amount of money that I've put in, right? Capital, these non-human components earn interest. And then entrepreneurship earns profits. So why do entrepreneurs do what they do? Because they can make money, right? There's some sort of profit to it. And it doesn't necessarily have to be physical money. It can also be profits in like happiness or profits in people being better off in the world. Or there's some sort of way that they are profiting from the transactions. And that's why they bring together the land pieces, the labor pieces, and the capital pieces and organize them all together. They do this because there's some sort of profit potential for them. So that's kind of the neat part about entrepreneurship. So we've gone from the first question. Let's go to the second question. When do choices made in the pursuit of self-interest also promote the social interest? You know, that's kind of the weird one. I make compost out of my food scraps. Is that in the social interest? It's kind of in my self-interest because I have plants that like, you know, dirt. Um, I drive an SUV, which isn't necessarily the best for envir the environment. How does that match the social interest? Well, okay. Let's think about it. Every day, 7.7 .7 plus billion people, billion, that's so many people in the world, make economic choices. They're going to figure out for themselves what their what, their how, and their for whom of goods and services are. 7.7 .7 billion people make that decision every day. And these choices are made by people who are pursuing their self-interest. I drive the car I want to drive. I go to classes that I want to go to. Um, you at the other end of the screen are watching this video for some reason and that some reason was self-interested. You ate something for breakfast today probably or you didn't eat something for breakfast today. Whatever choice you made for that breakfast decision, that's something that you did to promote your self-interest. Now, does that necessarily mean you're promoting the social interest? Well, self-interest is the choices that you're kind of making for yourself. Social interest is the choices that are best for society. Um, so we kind of call these just sort of like the social interest and they have two different dimensions. We have what's efficient. Okay. So is this an efficient decision? Maybe we pollute a little bit, but it saves a lot of pollution in the long run. Maybe that could be efficient. I don't know. Um, we're going to figure that out. And then we have to think about the idea of like fairness. Because there might be ways that it's efficient to do something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the fair way to do something. So when we have to debate about the social interest, these are the two different dimensions that we have to consider is the efficiency and the fairness of things. We're going to talk about that a lot in this course. So with this interest, the questions about social interest are kind of hard to answer. Um, the reason why they're hard to answer is because there's a lot of different opinions. There's going to be a lot of discussion and debate and disagreement and very angry TikTok videos, right? There's lots of different opinions on every single subject that there is. So let me, let me just like throw out four subjects, four topics that tend to generate discussion. Um, globalization, information age, monopolies, climate change, and financial instability. Let's go through that. Well, globalization, what does that mean? Globalization is the expansion of international trade. It's why there's aluminum producers for American beer companies that are all over the world. And how does that get here? And what do we give back? And how does the beer get produced? And then where does the beer go? What other countries does it go to, right? This expansion of international trade, and that's just one industry. This happens for thousands of industries. Globalization is this expansion of international trade. It's borrowing and lending and investment. Now, globalization is certainly in the self-interest of consumers. It makes it so the goods and services that we have are cheaper. If this was produced in, I don't know, Peru, I don't actually know where it was produced, but I was just thinking about tomatoes. If this was produced in Peru, it's certainly in my self-interest that this globalization happened to, to bring things closer together and for cheaper prices, right? These are the self-interest of consumers who like to buy low-cost imported goods and services. Sometimes when we import things from other countries, it's cheaper. Um, back to the fact that the United States is a service-based economy. If we are a service-based economy, this means that we are not producing physical goods at the same level that other countries are. So maybe we instead want to trade with those other countries. Maybe we'll trade some services for some physical durable goods. And that can be in self-interest. Now, globalization is also in the self-interest of the firms. 
Firms love producing goods in low cost areas and selling them in high cost areas. They love going to the cheapest place that they could possibly be produce something, producing it there, shipping it back and selling it for a markup, right? That is in their self-interest. But globalization, is, is it in the self-interest of low wage workers in other countries? Well, that's, that's, that's a really big question. Um, and there's a lot of answers to that. And there's no necessarily, okay, I, I'm an economist. I just look at the question, but it's not my job to say what's right and wrong. What my job is, is to present the evidence. So it may not necessarily be in their self-interest. So what's better at the end of the day? That's what economics is here to figure out. And obviously there's a lot of debate that will happen on that topic, right? Because there's a lot of different opinions and there's a lot of different ways that people preference their own self-interest versus social interest and what this looks like together and how they balance. And since it's different for every single person, there could be a lot of different conversations that might result in different answers to the question of, is globalization in the social interest? It depends. It depends. Um, what about information age and monopolies? So we've had this information revolution for years, right? Uh, back in the 1960s, you had to go find an atlas to find where maybe your friend lives and get to where they are. And you're going to have to drive the directions you find on this map. That sounds terrible. I grew up in the MapQuest era, and even that I don't want to do anymore, where like you look up the place on MapQuest and print out, print, physically print the directions and you take them while driving. Now I just have, what, uh, Google Maps on my phone. I say, hey, take me to such and such as house. And it just gives me the directions to go to someone's house. This is a revolution. That's so insane that in 40 years, we've gotten from the point where we had to figure out physical maps from people whose jobs were cartographers to figure out physical maps to the point where I can just pull up directions to any place in the world in a matter of seconds on my phone. This technology, technology change is kind of the part of information age monopolies because that means a lot of this information is now held in very close uh, quarters, right? Now it serves a lot of self-interest. It's in my self-interest that I really enjoy being able to get wherever I want without having to go find a map because um, I have tried to navigate maps before. I'm terrible at it. I can barely find where East and West are. It's not my thing. Uh, it's also working in the self-interest of people like Bill Gates from Microsoft or Gordon Moore of Intel, people who got really rich off of this. But is this in the social interest? It might be in my self-interest to be able to navigate quickly. It might be in their self-interest to sell me these goods. But is that best for society? That answer depends on who you are and how you preference different things. A lot of the reason why I'm bringing up these topics is to go ahead and introduce the idea that we're going to address each of these questions, each of these situations with the economic way of thinking. We're going to try to approach these questions as scientists um, and figure out what does the data say and how, how does this all work together instead of just having these feelings, right? These are the difference between positive and normative statements. I'm going to mention that later, but it's the difference between like, I feel like purple's the prettiest color. That's not really a testable implication for a scientist, right? But saying um, purple we believe might be the preferred color if it is sold more than 4% of times gross above all other colors in the retail section of these three stores. That is a testable implication. I can test that. And we're going to try to make testable implications out of big and hotly debated items. So climate change, that's a huge political issue right now. I mean, besides everything else going on, a lot of people are very, very worried about climate change. There's rising tides, there, there's um, ice caps melting, there's different sort of pathogens from thousands of years ago that all of a sudden are like being uniced. Uh, two thirds of the emissions come from the US, China, EU, Russia, and India. China and India have the fastest growing emissions in the world. Um, each day we have to make a choice in between, are we going to use the electricity to turn on the computer to re record this lecture or what are we going to do? 
how does this go along to, or this use of gas and electricity contribute to carbon emissions? Is this in our self-interest or is this in our social interest? Is it in everybody's best interest to watch this lecture right now or is it in the social interest to not? Depends. Um, economic instability. In 2008, the banks were in trouble. I remember I was graduating high school at the time. I was actually working for a finance company too. And I remember coming into work that day and the phones were just all blaring. And I was like, oh, oh no. And me as my little scared high school self, like picked up the phone like, um, hello, such and such financial advisors, how may I help you today? And they're just screaming on the other end because there's a lot of economic instability and people were scared because all of a sudden overnight, a lot of their retirement funds were gone. What's in the social interest there? What's, what's in the self-interest there? Should banks be helped? Should they be put afloat? Should the auto industry at that time have been bailed out? Those are a lot of interesting questions. And that's what economics serves to think about. Now, this is too much for one video. I hope you're taking this in chunks. Remember to take breaks, drink lots of water, and we're going to get through everything. But this is sort of the material for the first half of chapter one. I'm going to go ahead and make another video that goes over the economic way of thinking, which is going to be the second part of chapter one. Okay, I hope everybody enjoys their day and have a wonderful time. Enjoy some of this beautiful weather, and I will talk to you soon.